It's unfortunate that I have to talk about that, but uh, <laughs> since I started some of the programs that they're using, I feel kind of obligated to do this because I've opposed their, their use of these programs from the very beginning in, in October of 2001. I mean, they're violating the civil rights of everybody in the world. So please start. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Let me get the pointer. And the, uh, uh, here we are, yes. Uh, as I said, you know, uh, uh, I was developing these programs back in the 90s. Uh, the problem we were facing there was that the <clears throat> digital explosion was uh, occurring starting in the late 80s and then into the 90s. And when the Cold War ended, the wall fell and, uh, and we lost the opposition we always referred to it as a, they couldn't hold up their end so we didn't have that balance you know in the world anymore so so everything fell apart so we had to find a new uh, a new uh, target to work well uh, the problem was we had those targets there all along nobody was working them okay that was the real problem so we, when you looked around at the communications of the world it was all going digital and we were looking at uh, mobile phones and the internet exploding and we couldn't, uh, they called it the volume, velocity, and variety problem uh, at NSA, and uh, we were falling behind. Actually, I was telling them that we couldn't keep up with the rate at which we were falling behind. <laughs> so in other words, we were falling behind continuously worse year after year. So we uh, decided to, um, as Dr. Taggart and I originally started this, uh, uh, the SIGINT Automation Research Center to address these kinds of problems, it was a center, it was like a skunk works. We brought all the talents together in one place and we uh, then would uh, uh, address a, con a, a certain problem. I would come from operations, I had the requirements and I knew exactly what needed to be done, what kind of information we needed to have to be able to produce intelligence that would, that would give us indications of uh, intentions and capabilities of potential enemies like terrorists or, or international crime or things like that. And uh, Dr. Taggart brought uh, some of the engineering and, uh, and uh, computer science uh, expertise, plus uh, we had access to physicists and uh, other mathematicians, of course. Of course, I brought in uh, uh, crypto mathematicians as well as analysts and linguists and things like that. So we brought all those skills together in one place. So that when we had a problem, we would sit down and say, now this is the problem we're going to work, and here's your part of it, here's your part, and what we're trying to do is get to that goal. So everybody knew what the goal was and they knew their part in that effort. So it was all, all the technology people were all together and everybody understood what we were doing, where we were heading, what the objectives were. So then we would start to iteratively develop it. <clears throat> Since we knew where we wanted to go, we didn't have to lay out a plan. We just started the development almost immediately. And we let documentation come up later because we were rapid development, rapid prototyping, that kind of thing. That, so, this iterative develop technique was the way we did it. Uh, <clears throat> and so we started to attack the internet and the first problem was acquisition of information. So we needed to have uh, sessionizers that would sessionize at the rate of fiber optic lines. So 155 megabits per fiber line. And uh, we, we had our objective to go to uh, individual deployments to handle 64 or 10 gigabit lines. Uh, that was our intent. <clears throat> But I had to set the objective as to what the overall capacity was that we were aiming at, and I set that at 20 terabytes a minute. So we had to be able to not collect the data, but be able to look into the 20 terabytes a minute to see what was important in there, decide what that was, and pull it out for collection and follow-on analysis and uh, reporting of threats. Uh, that was, that, we made it not a collection problem, but a selection problem. So it was a totally different perspective than NSA had before. They, they'd always considered it a collection issue. If we just collect it, you'll end up getting what you need and you can sort it out later. But we wanted to make that decision right up front so that we could uh, eliminate the transport of useless information, the storage of useless information, only focus in on what was important and relevant to the issues that we wanted to, to analyze and report on or had national SIGINT requirements to do. Uh, so in that case, we ended up needing the kinds of information to see here for uh, tracking Bob, which is where when he turns on his computer or he, or he uses his credit card or his phone or he, he has a smart card that he uses to go down a toll road to pay the tolls. So he's making a, a, a individual events or then getting uh, electronic recognition and electronic recording. So all those things then, or in your cell phone, if you have GPS on your cell phone, we can track you as you move along. 
Um, that's the, the, uh, the estimates that I heard, uh, the most recent estimates that have been from the Snowden material. Uh, they're collecting on the order of uh, 5 billion cell phone G GPS locations every day. So that's on the mobile phone network. Uh, around. I assume it's around the world. Uh, uh, and it's on everybody, <laughs> US citizens included. By the way, this, uh, <clears throat> I should start out by saying this bulk collection started against US citizens first. And then it moved to foreigners. So <clears throat> you're being treated just like a US citizen, OK? <laughs> That's the problem, but I had a problem right from the beginning. I mean, I not only had the problem with the U.S. citizen part because it was unconstitutional, it's against our laws. We had, our laws applied to U.S. citizens, not the uh, acquisition of uh, intelligence for foreigners. But also I, I objected to it on the foreign principle of collecting every foreign uh, person because they weren't relevant to any, any national SIGINT requirements we had. Uh, and so I didn't really realize the real true intent behind NSA's bulk acquisition until much later uh, uh, when, uh, for example, in 2011, um, an interview with Bart Gelman, uh, Director Mueller of the FBI, said he'd been using the Stellar Wind program, which is the domestic spying program, since 2001. So that means the FBI, it's for law enforcement, they were using this data. And then later on in last year, uh, the DEA, uh, Reuters gave a report on the DEA use of NSA information uh, they created a SOD, a, sig a Special Operations Division, which, which looked into uh, the NSA collection, and they used it to target for law enforcement. A and uh, the procedures, and I'll get into them, uh, simply violated our entire constitution and the entire uh, judicial process. And they're subverting that around the world. So this is really very serious. I and mean, we don't really start objecting to this and doing it really vigorously. I mean, we have a real chance of losing our democracies around the world. This is a totalitarian process of the nth degree. I mean, even your chancellor came out and said, this is just like the Stasi. Well, it's much better than the Stasi, okay? Uh, and uh, you're, you're, uh, there was a, a fellow, uh, Wolfgang Schmidt, who was a former lieutenant colonel in the East German Stasi, who commented, I think it was in June of 2013, just after the Snowden material started coming out, uh, that that uh, for, he said uh, about the NSA surveillance program that for us this would have been a dream come true. Well, that's telling you. I mean, uh, this is, these are totalitarian procedures. We're going down this path. And now that the police force is using, we're heading towards that police state also. And it fits right in with the passing of the latest NDA. There's all this stuff that's going on. People in the United States are starting to object about this. I mean, the, the Congress almost succeeded in unfunding NSA. And I'm still supporting that, by the way. Uh, they need to be unfunded because they need to stop this. It's not acceptable for a democracy. It does not compatible with democracy anywhere. So <clears throat> this is the kind of information they need to do this kind of tracking of individuals, also of groups. I mean, they would look at the entire group of people who were involved in terrorism or just your group, or if you were the Tea Party, they, they have the tracking of the Tea Party or the tracking of religious groups, or any group in the, in the world. It's not just NSA, in copying and, and doing the United States. It's now the entire world. And I'll show you how that works. Uh, but this is the key kind of information you need to get it. Now, in order to get that, uh, they need to tap into the fiber optic lines. Uh, I don't know that any of them are Deutsche Telekom, but <laughs> I looked at Deutsche Telekom and took AT&T, Verizon, which I knew were cooperating with NSA and uh, British Telecom, which are probably cooperating with GCHQ. And I, of course, I threw in Deutsche Telekom just to show how they would attack the network. And it's the, the principle is to look at uh, the fiber lines and how they, how, how they converge to given, given points in the world. And then you want to put the collection devices at the, points, the points where multiple lines converge, because then those devices can see multiple lines simultaneously. And you could take, you know, most of the lines aren't fully loaded anyway, so you, you, you have the capacity to take multiple lines by one, one narrowest device can maybe do two 10 gigabit lines simultaneously until it gets overloaded, then you have to have another device backing it up. But that's the idea, so that you can put them in those points where that convergence occurs, then you see many more, many more lines that way. So I looked at that and I uh, went on the web <laughs> and I pulled down all the fiber lines that. Uh, People were uh, advertising the three here, AT&T, Verizon, uh, Bridge Telecom, also uh, Deutsche Telecom, 
and, uh, and just looked at cities where three or more fiber lines were converging. And uh, then I said, these are likely points for, uh, for acquisition of data. Most of them were in the United States. About, uh, for AT&T, 22 of 32, I think, were in the United States, simply because 80% of the entire uh, fiber network goes through the United States, by design, I might say. <laughs> Uh, that was, uh, there's no coincidence that the lines from uh, South America go up to Miami and then back down to South America because <laughs> that gives them the opportunity to see what's on those lines. At any rate, uh, these, were the, these were some of the convergent points and I was simply listing out the cities where uh, multiple lines converge for AT&T at New York and also Verizon had multiple lines and British Telecom. That gives you the opportunity to put a forwarding position in New York, for example and then have acquisitions and taps, if you will, uh, knowledge, uh, either with or without the knowledge of these companies, uh, and then take that data off it and pass it back to a central point to forward back using perhaps the unused uh, fiber lines of the existing telecoms. <laughs> so it's a matter of uh, how you get data back. It's the way you organize and simplify data forwarding. Uh, so these were some of the ones in the US. Uh, there are a little few more here in the US. Then, of course, I just went to, to uh, uh, other locations around the world. And you, these are just highly likely places they would place these devices to collect the information. Now, I know the, uh, in, in a newspaper in uh, the Netherlands, they just published a number of uh, locations of the fiber optic taps that they had for NSA, along with uh, uh, a comment that said greater than uh, 50,000 implants. Now, that, that meant, of course, they they were implanting software in different switches and different servers to, uh, and computers to own them, basically, so that the routers can be effect effectively used as sorters of information, like if uh, Chancellor Merkel went somewhere in, in the world, uh, her phone number could be a task on those routers, and uh, if they ever saw it, wherever it was, her stuff could be routed back to the United States. That's the way you could use these implants. So, but that's over 50,000 of them. So basically, NSA owns the net. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the idea of now once you acquire the data, you have to analyze it. Now, the principle we used uh, is being able to look into 20 terabytes a minute is kind of a difficult thing. You have to organize it so efficiently so you don't, if any part of it, this process starts to back up, it starts to fail and you, it falls. So you have to make sure you do everything as rapidly as you can to keep up with the rate of input because this input is 24 hours a day. So uh, we had to do this with looking at metadata relationships. Now, metadata relationships allow you to at least group social networks together of people and also uh, cooperative networks in the community, uh, uh, companies collaborating or things like that will show up in the social networking. Um, and so uh, what that means is if you have, for example, a set of targets that's known, uh, then you can look through this entire social networking of the uh, probably on the order of 4.5 billion people in the world using either telephones or email or some sort of uh, network uh, that you can acquire here. Um, and you can look at that and then see, uh, we, we, we defined it as the area suspicious area or the zone of suspicion is within two degrees of a known uh, bad guy. Or a, like if these were terrorists, you go out two degrees, that's like the first degree and then that's the second but you don't go beyond that to the other seven billion people in the world. That's a targeted attack. And now you add other kinds of information to it, like for example, in terrorism, if, it, if you uh, have a, uh, a satellite phone coming out of the mountains in Afghanistan or something out of the jungles in Colombia, a satellite phone, then you pretty, have a pretty good idea that that's probably, in the one case, a dope dealer, in the other case, a terrorist. So and that, that, that gives you a reason to target that. So you add those to the zone of suspicion, okay? And you, that's what you work, but it's a finite focused effort. And now it's a manageable set of data. I mean, you have about four or 5,000 analysts that would look at that and you could uh, perhaps have uh, 100,000 targets in any given day. So that's a manageable problem now. That was the whole objective because up to that point, everybody was doing things like Google searches with words or phrases and they would get tens of thousands of returns every day. All that data would go away the next day, they'd get another ten, tens of, groups of tens of thousands coming in. So it was making their job almost impossible. That's why they missed all the terrorist attacks, the bomber in, the, in uh, Boston, the shooter in Fort Hood, the bomber in Times Square, New York City, and the underwear bomber. Not that they didn't have the data, 
They just, they were buried in other kinds of data that they were looking through. So it made them dysfunctional. So one of the reasons I opposed it, collecting on everything on everybody in the world is because of this dys dysfunctionality when you get buried with data. I mean, they don't have smart approaches to sort it out. That's why they continually fail. So, but the idea is to do this now, um, and just take the public switch telephone network for case, a case in point. Uh, um, it's all organized uh, by zones of the world. It's divided into nine zones. Um, after you dial 0001 or 011 if you're in the US, uh, then the next number is the area of, that, of the world. Um, and, uh, or it could be uh, you're going internationally within a zone, country to country. Uh, so you could, it's either a country code or an area code of the world. So. But uh, if you looked at that and used that as information, then it boils it down into this kind of relationship. If you have zero, zero, then one end is guaranteed to be foreign. Uh, it may be foreign to foreign with country to country or, or from one zone to another, but it's still at least one end is foreign. If, if, it's, uh, if it's the United States to foreign, it's a zero, one or zero, one, one. If you have that case, you always know one end's foreign also. So just by, by the prefix numbers to get to the switches for international communications, you know that at least one end is foreign or both ends are foreign of these numbers. They're starting with this, these switch accesses here. If it goes to one, then you know it's internally US to US. That to me separated the constitutionality uh, issue out immediately uh, with the phone system anyway. For this, for others, you do it by the IPv4 or IPv6 numbers or uh, MAC numbers or, or user ID and uh, service provider combinations or a combination of all of that. But those kinds of things separate these groups of things out so that you get one end is foreign uh, or, or, or both ends are in the United States and that's the place you want to delete all of this. We didn't want to have any of that because that's against our constitution. This is acquired without a warrant. Uh, that's why I objected to the uh, FISA court. I think all the FISA court should be fired. They've done a disservice to the United States, to the Constitution, and everything, every law we've ever had. They've, they, they've gone back to issuing general uh, warrants or general writs, they used to call them in, when King George was in charge, you know, George III, 240 years ago. Uh, we got rid of a totalitarian state back then, and the problem is we don't recognize in the United States what a totalitarian state do, is or what it's, what it's like. You here have some experience personally, the people who are living here have experienced it in East Germany. So, I mean, and I've been over arguing over there, and I use these quotes from Chancellor Merkel or, or uh, Wolfgang Schmidt, the, the cases in point where people have firsthand experience of saying what this is, and we should listen to that in the United States. We should listen. Uh, it's the fact that we have no experience in it for several hundred years anyway. <laughs> so, except in the case of Nixon, and that he only involved a finite number of people. I mean, what Nixon did is finite. This is a orders of magnitude more than that. I mean, Nixon did a few thousand people. This is like everybody, 300 million plus. Just in the United States. <clears throat> so, but at any rate, uh, so this would be a, a way to separate it out. And then of course you use the two degrees of separation in, in the foreign, US to foreign or foreign to foreign. And then that separates it all down. That's an acceptable attack for every country in the world. I mean, there are you going after terrorists calling somebody in your country and who those people in your country are calling. That's, a, that's the limit. That's the, the zone of suspicion. You don't go beyond that. And that gives it a focused issue for your analysts in, your, in the BND or any of the other services or GCHQ. It makes it manageable now. Um, and it gives privacy to everybody else. All that data that's being passed around that you're passing around isn't in the databases anymore. Whereas now, they took the total approach of saying, let's collect everything and, not, and not, uh, not delete anything, and, and that's what they're doing. That's why they have to build Bluffdale, that million square foot facility to store all this data. They're getting all the data, they just don't know what to do with it. Because again, their analysts are buried, they're storing it on the hopes that somebody, uh, under the, uh, the, uh, or, uh, the uh, request they made for private industry uh, about a year and a half ago, it was, it was the White House Big Data Initiative, uh, where they were soliciting companies to come in with algorithms that would look through big data and figure out what was important in there for them to, to take out of that and give it to their analysts to analyze and report on. I'll show you some of the objectives that they're trying to do here too. One is going back to that graph is trying to do new development, new target development automatically, which we had achieved already. So 
but they threw that away. Uh, so, uh, but the other is to try to get profiles of transactional relationships in communities. That means they're profiling a community and what it's a community and what it's doing to try to predict what they're intending to do. Like for example, if uh, if you have a dope ring that's run out of Colombia and they're trying to sell dope to somebody in the United States, you have to have a transaction for a contact there to make the deal. Then you have to have the transaction for transfer of funds. Then you have to have other transactions that would evidence in that transactional profile that community that would show movement of the dope to the transporters and the transporters moving it to uh, to the uh, customer in the United States. So you could see all those transactions. The point is how many of those transactions show a profile that, that proves that that's what they're doing. And that's the kind of uh, automated uh, analytic uh, uh, processing they want. They want to look at transactional profiles, get profiles of interest to do automatic reporting, and, and then do intervention. Uh, uh, this would be before the, before the fact. So this is what intelligence is supposed to do, uh, predictions and intentions of intentions and capabilities, not forensics. What they're doing now is forensics. You know, they, they look at the Boston bombers and they go, go back and see what they did. And they come back and say, oh, yeah, they did all this. Well, that's a police job. The intelligence job is to do prediction of intentions and capabilities so that there's an opportunity to intervene to stop something or to influence it in some way or another, diplomatically or militarily or something. Um, that's not the job of, uh, that's the police forensics is not the job of intelligence. But that's what they've adopted. That's because their main support is now for law enforcement. That's real, and nobody's talking about that. But they're spreading it around the world, now I get into that. So, um, so the idea is just to take one bad guy and look at the, the first contact and only go out two degrees. Now, when you do this and you input the, the uh, attributes of the uh, people that you want to select out of the database, or the, the data flow of 20, 20 terabytes or more, we were going to scale up after 20. But so you only need the attributes of these two to get that entire group. If you start putting the attributes here of these, you now get the third degree down. So then everything goes up exponentially in terms of numbers of targets you're looking at. So you need to, again, try to keep it finite as best you can. So that, only these two are the ones. So that gets to be a finite number of attributes you're looking for in this flow of information as it's going by. So now it's a manageable thing to detect. Uh, Naris devices can automatically do that for you. Um, so, so then, um, as, a, as an example, to show you the idea, this was all done by code, by the way. Uh, if you had two people who these two came into the California, this is, these are the two that they came, they came into the West Coast from Kuala Lumpur after they had a terrorist meeting over there. And uh, uh, the, uh, the Malaysian intelligence re reported that to us, that they were on the way. So <clears throat> uh, we also knew they were on the way, but they also made phone calls. These two made phone calls to Yemen, to the facility, uh, Al Qaeda facility in Yemen. And uh, General Alexander got up there and said, well, we couldn't tell the other end was in uh, California. I said, oh, I, <laughs> I said, this is impossible. He mustn't have had his caller ID on. I mean, the entire switch network works automatically. Either the switches know the data and they can route the calls back and forth, or they don't. And if you don't have all that data, you can't make the connection. So the switches have to know, and they have to pass that data, and that data is there. That's how caller ID works. So uh, I mean, all the data was there. I mean, if you were looking at the, at the Yemen end making the calls to the West Coast, you would see the number being dialed. If you're looking at the West Coast, you'd see that number associated with the number that it was calling, which was the Yemen facility. So I mean, you know, it's just impossible for me to conceive that they, that they would actually expect us to believe that, okay? But it's a way of, it's a way of covering up their, their level of incompetence. That's all. So at any rate, the idea is this goes along and you have uh, rules in there that if you uh, don't know uh, who someone is, you do things like uh, encrypt it until you get multiple attributes that will show, or multiple characteristics that will show they are in fact targets. In this case here, we knew we, we, this is the guy who financed everything in, in, out of Dubai. Uh, and so uh, we didn't have to, we could uncover him. All of this, by the way, is on the web. And we pulled this off the web and built this profile to show what they should have been doing, which they killed, by the way. This process could have worked for them. And then another thing they said, they didn't have the Connect the Dots program. 
beforehand? That is absolutely false. They've had that Connect to Dots program since 2000. So they had it years before 9-11. They also, they killed it. That was the problem. And they didn't resurrect it until they wanted to target everybody in the world, starting with everybody in the United States. So th this, this kind of thing just keeps going on. The code will simply take it all. It can be email or phone. Um, and as you see, once you identify people, you, can, you begin to target them. Um, if it's US protected, you'll see some of them show up here in, like, in the United States. Then you do, a, you do an encryption of the attributes so you can't tell who it is, but you still can uniquely encrypt it so you can follow the actions of what they're doing, who they're associating with. And, and that just continues through the entire. This was all we compiled about the 9-11 uh, hijackers prior to 9-11. But you can see how that would work. And I think that's the last one. And then finally, what you do is every, every, uh, every uh, see, the trillions of transactions will collapse down to billion, tens of billions of relationships. So you get, a real, you get a graph about that size of phone calls and a similar graph for uh, email or uh, computer communication. But then you want to do a timeline. You want to put things together in, in a time sequence by community. So here, here would be the, the phone numbers and emails of that community over this period of time. And you could see the relationships here and say something's going on here. What is that? And you could, if, for example, there is data with it, like a transcript of a phone call or an email or a file transfer or something you can read, there's data. So this tells you there's data with that transaction in, in this timeline. So, so then you could click on that, that symbol for the data and read the data and try to get an idea of what's going on with the transactions there. But their idea here is to try to automate the process of doing that so that they can look at these relationships and the combinations of relationships along with the data and see if they can automatically discover and automatically predict what their intentions and capabilities will be by what they're doing in this, uh, in this timeline. That's one of the things they, uh, they want it with the big data initiative. Uh, which is all possible, by the way. In fact, you can even, uh, we, were plan we were planning to write reports with that, taking this data, doing a, a diagnostic of the content of that, uh, together with the combinations and the community, the peop what the community was that we knew about. What the, if it was a terrorist and we had certain rules that we would look for, a combination we would look for, and statements over here in the data that we would then use to infer directly what their intentions were, what their actions were, if they were planning uh, an attack or something, we would use that to do that. And you could automatically <clears throat> make that uh, suggestion from just this kind of combination of data. Fortunately, I never got to finish that job for NSA because they could have used it against everybody in the world. And it could have been against uh, the Tea Party for targeting for the IRS. The IRS is a part of the Special Operations Division of the DEA and the FBI and the NSA. And they're all looking at NSA data, so they've got all this graphing. So, and they also could attack the, uh, to, uh, to attack, they use it to attack uh, uh, religious groups or the Occupy group or any political group that they don't agree with. I mean, after all, that's what they did with the, uh, with the emails of General Petraeus and General Allen. They went back to thousands of personal emails that they sent out. Well, where do you think they got it? They got it from the NSA database, from the upstream collection on the fiber optic taps that they've got and all the wires. That's how they're collecting all this data. Uh, that plus the, the other side of the PRISM program is to fill in the missing 20% that they didn't get from the upstream collection. So that gives them a fairly good idea on the uh, entire collection. But then all of this data is now being used by uh, law enforcement. I didn't have any evidence of exactly how they were doing it until the Reuters uh, report came out about it, the Drug Enforcement Agency, where, uh, where they had this uh, Special Operations Division set up uh, that in, it includes uh, the FBI, CIA, DIA, NSA, uh, the IRS, the DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, basically the big intelligence agencies, and, uh, and they're going through all of this data, and here, here are the rules for using this data. You can't reveal it to investigative reports or files. You never document it, okay? And you don't write any affidavits for the court, or you don't tell the attorneys in the, in the case you arrest. They're using it to arrest people, so these are the rules. You don't tell the attorneys, and you don't tell any of the court in the courts. You don't tell a judge or any of the any of the court proceedings in it. You don't add any documents for that. 
You, and you don't tell state or local officials people are going to do the arrest. Uh, and you don't tell your foreign counterparts. Now, that means all the foreign counterparts to the Drug Enforcement Agency and the FBI are getting this information this way, but they're not being told the source of it. And, and what they're doing is they're not telling the courts. In our side, that means to me, I call this a planned programmed perjury policy by the attorney, run by the Attorney General of the United States. In fact, uh, we had a lawsuit that was uh, challenging the constitutionality that was called um, Amnesty International against Clapper that just recently got thrown out of the Supreme Court. And it was thrown out based on the assurances of the uh, uh, the Solicitor General of the United States to the Supreme Court that they would, if they were using NSA data to prosecute or take or try anybody in the, in the courts that they would ensure that they were told that the source of their original arrest was the NSA data. That was a lie. They've never told anybody. Now the Solicitor General is trying to figure out how to recover. He's going to go try to go back and see how many cases have we used NSA data on. Now, I don't, I don't have any first-hand knowledge. All, all I have is that uh, uh, Dianne Feinstein, the, uh, uh, the chair of the Senate uh, Intelligence Committee, said that hundreds of people were arrested using this data every year. Well, this is a total violation of their constitutional rights in, our, in my country. They have the right to challenge discovery. That means they have the right to know what the original evidence was to arrest them. So they're violating their rights and their constitutional, uh, uh, actually it's, it's the uh, freedom of uh, association that's a violation of that because going by these associations, you're violating that, that right under the First Amendment, you're violating the privacy rights under the Fourth Amendment, and you're violating the, the, the uh, right not to testify against yourself under the Fifth Amendment because they're using that to, to acquire them. One of the, uh, one of the arresting uh, officers in, in state and local law enforcement, one that did the actual arrest, said that all we're told is like to go to this uh, parking lot, wait here, wait for this truck to pull into that slot, and then go arrest him and send the drug dogs in and have them sniff out the drugs. Well, they don't do that from metadata, right? Metadata doesn't tell you that. That comes from content. And again, that's from the upstream collection and the prison program. That's where they're getting all this content, including the um, the hundreds of millions of messages sent from phone to phone by everybody in the world every day. So uh, that's the, uh, the, the problem here for you is that uh, we're infecting your judicial system with the same process. You're not being told the original source here. So I don't know how your, your courts operate, but ours would, uh, ours it would simply be unconstitutional. Those cases would be thrown out of court immediately. So at any rate, uh, and for, to, to take evidence into court, they do what's called a parallel construction. That is, they take, uh, you think of uh, how, how uh, would you normally come around to get evidence that, to arrest them in the first place, then substitute that evidence for the NSA evidence. So that's where the perjury comes in. They're lying about the evidence they use to, uh, to, use to arrest people and try them. Uh, actually, they, they <clears throat> the primary way they do it is they, they get a plea bargain from the defendant because they show them all the evidence and they get them to plead. They don't, they don't say that it came from NSA collection without a warrant, you know, because then that would kill their case. <laughs> so, so it's a question of honesty and they end up being honest. But that's not new, right? <laughs> we have a consistent pattern here. These people lie all the time. I mean, if Clapper can lie to Congress and Alexander can lie to them, they can lie to the public, and they can get the, <clears throat> get the president to say things that aren't true. I mean, it's the whole, the whole foundation of this uh, process that's going on here is a, a pack of lies. It's all being managed by a secret court, in secret, with secret interpretations of laws that were written. Se Representative Sensenbrenner, who uh, helped to write the, the uh, Patriot Act, said, we wrote this act so that you couldn't do what you're doing. We didn't even know you were doing. This is because of Snowden's releases. When they found out what they were really doing, that came out of the documentations that Snowden took out of the NSA. He said, we, we wrote this law. This was never intended. That's because they had a secret interpretation of the words in his law. Well, I mean, that's a secret. And they're making, and this court, the secret court is making decisions about what is constitutional and what isn't. So that's a secret court making Say, setting up a secret constitution. So here, we, this is what a totalitarian state does. 
They do everything in secret. Our entire country was formed on the principle that the people were supposed to know what the government was doing, not the reverse. I mean, that's why we have the, the Bill of Rights. The, the, that's why those uh, freedoms are stated there. Because we came out of George III, and George III was violating all those principles that we held. Privacy and all of that. And, <clears throat> and uh, so we substituted George the W for George III. And then from there, it went downhill. Because it's only getting worse. Now they're doing, under Obama, they're doing more and more. So... At any rate, this is, a, this is the most serious problem I've ever seen, the, the, the most serious challenge to, to demo, democracies around the world. I mean, even the, even, the, even the Russians, of course, are envying this. I'm sure they would like to be able to do this. And we're only in a position to be able to do it because we've got the resources to apply against it, right? I mean, if you had, if you had similar resources, I'm sure that your governments may be in, in jeopardy of doing the same thing. The problem is, I, I think one of human nature, if you give, give that kind of power to people, eventually they use it, somehow. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a really a, a built-in human problem, I mean, that we have to find out ways and means of checking it. So we, we four who are whistleblowers from NSA, constructed 21 suggested recommendations for the president to uh, correct and make sure NSA is not going down the bad path anymore. I mean, this is the result of uh, 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 Vice President Cheney saying we're going to go to the dark side. This was the dark side. This is what they were trying to cover. This was the hospital visit to Ashcroft that tried to get him signed, saying this was legal to do. This was, this was all what that was all about. It was all about domestic spying, which was primarily where our laws would come in. But it's about everything. I mean, in my mind, they're making the entire intelligence network dysfunctional. That's the problem I see. But uh, if we don't stand up and do something, we, have a, we are in jeopardy of losing our democracies, all of us. And this is not, it's not a pleasure to have to sit here and talk to you about this, but this I felt I was obligated to do. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for this wonderful speech and presentation. And Mr. Kernan wants to ask you two questions, so go ahead. One short question. Would you call America a police state? Yes. It is a police state. At all. Okay. Second question, maybe of interest for all of you in the floor, on the floor. Is there any protection for individuals and as well for companies beyond shut down any communication? Actually, there are ways to do it, uh, but you have to, um, you can't use publicly available encryption systems because they're all compromised. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, you have to create your own encryption system. That's not hard to do, okay? That's not really hard. Uh, and, and that will really drive them crazy because now they'll have to work to get the answer, see? Right now, you see, all they use is the network, go across the network. If you have keys in there, they can go penetrate your system, pull the keys down, and, you know, your encryption is useless, okay? Or else they, they have uh, under the, uh, what is it, Bull Run program, uh, they have all the people who are generating these uh, publicly available encryption system put weaknesses in them so they can break them and they know the weaknesses. Well, the problem with that is so does everybody else can find those weaknesses too. So, I mean, you know, that's a problem too. So, I, if I'm recommending, okay, I'll recommend this. Get your own computer programmer in, in your own spaces and, and it, this becomes your, in, your intellectual property. You design your own encryption system and use it within your network of your, of your business. If you want to secure it, you have to define what you want to secure first. And that becomes your intellectual property. Now you've created a problem with it because it's not the shared, they don't know the algorithm and they don't know necessarily, so they have to start working on it. That's, a, that's not an easy job. I know because I've done that, okay? So, but once you do that, <clears throat> You have to also keep your encryption decryption system separate and isolated. That is offline. You have to have an air gap. If you, have, if you don't have an air gap, they can be penetrated. Okay, so, so the, and the other thing is you have to tempest it so that it doesn't radiate, so that the radiation can't be detected and also translated you know, into, back into the uh, data that's in the computer. Uh, so all of that, you have to do that and keep it isolated. And that, 
If you want to protect your intellectual capital, that's the way you have to do it. And then you're, you, then you're pretty much secure.